Today, I'm actually going to talk to you about something completely different um, because for those of you who know me, we, we've been talking about minimally invasive and things like that. But one of the things, because this topic, the title of this meeting, right, is the uh, ambulatory spine surgery meeting or MIS ambulatory spine surgery meeting. And one of the big parts of my life nowadays, just like minimally invasive development was from 1999 when we did the first percutaneous plif in the world back in, with Foley and Fessler to now is that we've been pushing other areas as well, like biologics. So I'm actually gonna curtail my comments today because I'm not gonna talk about all of BMP, uh, bone biology, all that kind of stuff, which you've heard a lot about. But I'm gonna talk about something that I think some, a lot of us have heard a little bit about, maybe not done as much with, maybe have used it in some fusions, but the really whole thing about stem cells, uh, because I think from the public side, from our patient side, this is an area of great demand. How many of you, do you have patients come to you, like, you know, for whatever in your clinic on a weekly basis and ask you about stem cell therapies? How many of you get those questions? I, I know I do, you know, or the laser, right? It's either the laser or stem cells. It's one of those two. But the truth is most of us in this room have never really researched, been taught or studied really anything about stem cells, except for maybe like, you know, bone biology, healing for the orthopedic surgeons, neurobiology, neuroregeneration for the neurosurgeons. But I want to use this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about really what people are talking about nowadays with stem cells. Because when people say stem cells, they mean a lot of different things. But I'd like to cone down a little bit for you about what stem cell therapies I think show the most promise right now. Because that's an area I'm spending a lot of time in my work, both doing basic science and clinical research through some labs that I work with. And also in a clinical uh, kind of prospective fashion to try to make sense of all this. So let's see, okay, there's my disclosures, all the usual disclosures, and I should disclose that I do work with one stem cell commercial lab uh, specifically, so that does influence my, and color my thought process. This is a, a company that was spun off of the uh, Boise, Idaho, Boise State University, I'm in Boise, and it became a commercial company, but um, the, a lot of the work I'm going to talk about is done with them on a basic science level, in addition to the labs at UCLA where I started my stem cell work about 10 years ago. So stem cells, like I said, in the lay world, in the press, among our patients, it's a big thing. People talk about Kobe Bryant, they talk about Peyton Manning, stem cell this, stem cell that, right? Kobe Bryant in 2009 flies off to Germany and gets a bunch of stem cells put into, uh, 2011, I'm sorry, gets a bunch of stem cells put into his knees because he was having some knee problems, he's getting some arthroscopic work done, and he wanted, at that time, you know, you all know that Kobe Bryant's retired, but at that time, his whole goal was to play a few more years, right? So he talked to a bunch of the orthopedic surgeons in LA and he made news because he flew to Germany. He had the same process that Peyton Manning had done on his neck a while back where they basically took his own mesenchymal stem cells out of his bone marrow and fat, cultured them and grew them, survived them for about three generations for about a month or so, a little less than a month, and then re-implanted those same cultured mesenchymal cartilage type cells back into his own knees. So, and when people wonder what Kobe Bryant had done, that's exactly what he had done. And so this, this stem cell process was an autologous, cultured, manipulated stem cell, his own, autologous, retransferred back into his patient. So, yeah. Sorry, I just had a quick question for you. Do you know just, because you know, like I've, I've done a lot of research. Yeah. Did they use uh, fetal bovine serum? They did. Very good question because how the, how stem cells are prepared is a huge thing, and that's one thing I'm I'm going to talk about a little bit and learn. But the particular company, there's a company in Germany called Codon. I don't know if you've heard of them. They're based out of Munich, uh, and they use fetal bovine ser uh, serum. They use uh, they deplete it of certain acid and sulfite compounds uh, to make it more hospitable to grow the cells in. Because it turns out with stem cell preparations, how you culture them directly affects their phenotype. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second. But uh, if you do it a certain way, like the typical way we typically grow cells in a, in a lab, they uh, enter one phenotype. And if you uh, do them what's called a nutrient deprived uh, type of fetal bovine serum, and then you subject them to lower temperatures, it creates another phenotype. Uh, think of it like making a seed, a more tough resistant seed of a cell, and those tend to proliferate and be more bioactive. So it's a lot of talking, but that's uh, some of the areas where if you really start getting into stem cell work, you begin to realize that 
there are many different ways of going about this, some of which may be more effective than others. So just to talk about this one more second, this is LA, you know, I'm from LA, this is the Lakers. Stem cells have in some ways come from LA, and the reason I say that is because the first person was Harvey Kornblum uh, at UCLA, and Jay, Jay Lim is back there, uh, who, who, who Jay and I went to college together and medical school together. Holy shit, and we're both neurosurgeons. <laughs> but Jay did his residency at UCLA, and Harvey Kornblum was one of the first scientists to take mesenchymal fat cells and come up with a process of kind of reverse engineering them and creating stem, mesenchymal stem cells from them. And that process was actually developed in the San Fernando Valley in a private kind of clinic hospital. Then it was moved to UCLA, and UCLA stem cell labs came from that. So a lot of the early 1990s, uh, on eight, late 80s to 90s work was on reverse kind of manipulating fat cells in your own bone marrow cells to get these stem cells. And so you have to understand, and you have to understand the third, second thing that qualifies a lot of my statements is in the United States of America, it's still technically illegal to take a cell and culture or manipulate it and re-implant it or sell it as such. So the big FDA caveat is we cannot manipulate your cells for use in you. Does that make sense at all? Or anybody else's cells for use in uh, an allograft type situation, okay? So that's why all these athletes were flying, these are young men, very good stem cells, all flew overseas to get these processes done. And that's one very important caveat to understand that uh, well, you have to differentiate. Are you talking about autologous or allograft type tissue? And again, we all know from the bone biology work from like Cleveland Clinic and things like that, that our own inherent stem cell populations decline rapidly in bioavailability and bioactivity beginning in our 50s, sometimes even in our late 40s. And by the time we're in our mid 60s, or by the time we're even in our early 60s, our bio, our own stem cells, mesenchymal osteoprogenitor stem cells, or even mesenchymal pluripotent uh, one, one step upstream are essentially not bioactive. So culturing, purifying your own stem cells after the age of 50, 55 is of questionable value. And that's another thing that was very much learned at the UCLA labs from the fat and autologous bone marrow work that was done there over 15 years. Okay, so a lot of preamble, but it's important that you know that for those of you who don't like, you know, uh, I barely do this, but keep up with stem cell therapies. So. That's led to this commercial process that's called the Regenekine process. And basically, again, you take your own cells, you culture it in the special media, you go through it, you culture it, manipulate it, and then you bring it back. In the United States, you hear about these private clinics doing the Regenekine process too. And really what it is is, again, it's manipulating a lot of, the full Regenekine process involves manipulating cell and culturing it. In the United States, we don't do that. The Regenekine process is basically you take the cells out of you, you put it in some media, you can give it right back. And that's the eugenicine process as we know it in the United States. In Europe, where it was created, it was actually slightly different. They actually culture it, treat it, and then after a while, give it back to you. So it's a slightly different process. And I think it's important to recognize that even though it's got the same name overseas and here in the United States, they're two technically slightly different, actually significantly different processes. So what you're hearing about now, like Cleveland Clinic just last week released a beautiful study on early stem cell therapy after stroke. They could show that they could save damaged brain tissue and, and, and improve the uh, injured per number of brain tissue. You also read other things about similar studies for uh, myocardial infarction. You're reading studies about multiple sclerosis. The FDA just completed a phase two study on intractable lupus vasculitis. And they show that intravenous biweekly infusion of mesenchymal umbilical cord stem cells can suppress all the inflammatory markers of active lupus and put a significant portion of those patients into remission. So all this desperate work, all this like widely ranging work from, neuro, from what sounds like anti-inflammatory autoimmune modulation to cartilage growth to uh, limitations of stroke and neurological injury. So how can stem cells achieve all this? And I think it's really important to realize that stem cells are not magical. For the longest time, how many of you believe that when you inject stem cells, they grow and reproduce or, or regenerate certain tissue? How many of you on some level believe that or at some point believe that? I did. I, 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 was, I actually worked at a lab at Yale. Remember, Jay, when we were medical students at Yale, Dr. Spencer's lab? They would go down to St. Kitts and inject stem cells, fetal stem cells for, for Parkinson's disease. And, we re, and those patients, many of them got better because we truly believed at that time in history in the early 90s that stem cell injections for Parkinson's would actually regenerate neural connections. Turns out that's completely untrue. In fact, I'm going to show you some facts that will let you know that stem cells don't grow at all. They don't do that. So it turns 
on our head a lot of what we think about stem cells because they don't work that way. And the question is, if that they don't work that way, how do they work? Because I'm going to tell you a simple little fact that's true and is being played across the entire country and has been accepted by the FDA too. The FDA now knows that when you inject stem cells anywhere, I don't care if it's your knee cartilage or in the brain or wherever, your heart muscle, stem cells that you injected are undetectable within one to two weeks, depending on the target area and the vascular flow in the area. So basically stem cell effects can last weeks and months, but yet the stem cells themselves are undetectable, gone, dead, removed within about a week for most tissue. So then you start thinking about how does this stuff actually work? Okay, so what the vast majority of everything I just told you about involves nowadays the use of umbilical cords uh, blood and, and amnion and chorion and all those various layers of the fetal uh, and umbilical placental tissue. And the reason is we're looking for rich stores of early pluripotent stem cells and multipotent stem cells that express a rich variety of anabolic or growth-related cytokines that will modulate growth and inflammation. And that's really why all the research has focused on some version like that because this is a ready source that's readily available all the time from healthy pregnancies. And that's one thing everyone's beginning to realize because for the longest time we would struggle to take your own fat and things like that. But now we realize that from young healthy mothers, this is readily accessible tissue, very easy to get and very, you know, large quantities. And also I'll mention in a second, they're non-antigenic. Within the first week of life, umbilical cord stem cells and mesenchymal stem cells from the amnion or chorion do not express typical MHC antigens. So you can take one baby's mom's and baby's umbilical cord and you can actually put it in anybody. There's no uh, a host versus graft reaction, which is very, very interesting. But after about a week or so, they, they begin to express those antigens. So that's why delayed abortions of fetal tissue in other countries that have been harvested in later phases of life uh, do show rejection. And that's a very second important fact as well. So that having been said, that's what we're talking about. So the vast majority of things you read about nowadays in the United States that's real research comes from this concept of using some type of uh, child-derived tissue to create, to isolate these extremely bioactive. If old people's stem cells aren't active, well, guess what? Children's mesenchymal stem cells are crazily active. So they've been found the nucleated fraction, the multipotent stromal cells, not as good as a fetal abortion, which are totally, multi, uh, are totally completely uh, totally potent, but these are multipotent cells. And they can differentiate along mesenchymal stem cells lines into osteoblasts and chondrocytes. One of the things about why these things are very interesting is that umbilical cord derived stem cells exposed to your own fat and bone marrow stem cells have longer telomeres. And you've been hearing a lot about telomeres. Why do cells die? This is a very important fact. Why do cells slowly stop becoming active, right? And we now realize is that one of the things is a telomere. It's a little piece of DNA at the end of all our chromosomes that it's almost like a ticket, like a, a, a ticket to ride a roller coaster. Every time you clone yourself or the cells regenerate, they take a little piece off the telomere. And so depending on the length of telomeres will determine <clears throat> in many ways the longevity of cells and their reproductive capability over time. So UCB derived uh, uh, stem cells have longer telomeres activity than those from bone marrow apples and as such have the highest proliferative potentials. So when I said they die within a week or two, that doesn't mean they don't grow. They do grow for about three, four generations and then they just, the body eliminates them for a typical area. And again, it varies with blood flow. The more, the less vascular in areas like a disc space, the longer they hang out. If you put stem cells, for example, to make burn graft, uh, skin grafts heal, they're gone within like not just, not just weeks, but days. So it depends on the vascular flow. And they're not exposed to environmental mutagens, so they have less inherent mutagenic lines. Anybody who's ever done stem cell work knows that if you take just to say a dead person, you would take out the stem cells, uh, uh, fat stem cells or bone marrow stem cells out of them, and you culture them over about 10 generations, 15 generations, you'll see 30% mutagenic activity. That means they'll have 30% of their coding sequences that you follow, their oncogenes will start to turn on. In other words, cells mutate over time, which has always been my deep concern about using older people's stem cells, putting it back in us. Children's stem cells do not display the same inherent mutagenicity by just simple culture line uh, work as, as things. So I, I'm saying all this because I want you to really get a big baseline because there's so much misinformation out there about stem cells. 
So when we talk about, again, these are all the various types of tissues that are being looked at from umbilical cords, from PRP to bone marrow concentration and amniotic fluid. And really they vary in their cellular content and their bioactivity and also some of the things I talked about, their inherent kind of um, age dependency and things like that, but I, I won't get into it. And also uh, that's probably a conversation for another day. But the rationale is the umbilical cord fluid has these cells, but also the umbilical cord fluid isolated not only has the cells, but it also has all these cytokines. And this is really important because I'm gonna say something for later that it turns out if you use umbilical cord stem cells, or if you just blenderize them and just take all the lysate and the cytokines and stick it in, they have the same activity and they yield almost the same results, which is fascinating because it suggests that the cytokine activity is more important than the cellular activity. So there's something to think about, but that's, the point is, is that every year, every day, every month, the list grows of all the putative important cytokines that are involved in tissue healing and regeneration. So. As such, umbilical cord uh, blood and lysate fluid from the umbilical cord cells has been shown to stimulate bone marrow and cartilage cells in vitro in very similar amounts. And so early clinical data does suggest this from the knee literature, cartilage resurfacing, bone consolidation, and as I mentioned, for treating autoimmune diseases like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and multiple sclerosis. So. Coming back, this is a paper we presented at, in the Congress of Neurosurgery last year of how it actually for us, for as spine surgeons, how it affects bone marrow, stroma, and cartilage healing. And so some of the work we've done, we were gonna publish this in Journal of Neurosurgery this year. We'll also be publishing a similar basic science, basic science paper in cell biology this year. Um, so again, these contain cytokines, uh, all the ones we know about, angiogenesis factor one, VGF, VGF2, FGF1, but there are also other cytokines like IL-8, MCP1, MIP1 beta, which are understudied, which are really more cell signaling molecules. They're not bone growth molecules, they're cell signaling molecules. And they also have significant activity in the whole inflammatory cascade in general in terms of tissue response. So again, and all of a sudden, like I said earlier, umbilical cord cells are immune naive. So this is gonna bore the shit out of you. I'm sorry about this, but this is the Seattle Science Foundation, right? So well, here you go, buddy maybe some hardcore science, right? So graphs, death by graphs, so here we go. So when you look at cytokine expression versus umbilical cord fluid versus lysate, one is the darker gray is the actual lysate, is this fluid with cells, and the black is the fluid after you blenderize them and kill all the cells and just get the cell membranes in the inner intracellular context. And you can see their activities are, and the cytokine expression from the cells that you inject them into are very similar. So that was a big, big step in the learning process of what actually is doing the healing, what's causing the effect. It's not the cells growing and making stuff, it's the cells and the chemicals they have themselves. Yeah, that's IL-1, exactly. Oh, no, the actual cytokine, the chemical itself. These, uh, just so you know, one of the most amazing things that I've humbly learned, we remember when we were all medical students, you're in like their little microbiology lab doing Western and Southern blots and doing little pipettes. Nowadays, they have these machines that are just amazing. They just make me cry every time I see it because I think about all the pipetting we used to do. They have microbeads and they can, do, they can run like 100 radioamino assays rapidly. You never have to do a Western blot in your life. The machine just pumps out the data. It takes about uh, 12 hours to run. You can do like 60, 70 wells with just less than a half a millimeter in each one, and it will generate this data. It's so rapid, it's amazing. It's like rapid sequencers for genes. It's a, the ability to analyze chemicals and cytokines. It's just totally different from when we were grad students and medical students. It's just a completely different world. It's kind of awesome, actually, but the point is, is that's what we see, and that's what all this data is from these rapid RIA radio amino assay machines. So when you look at the compared to bone uh, marrow profile, it's very similar to activated bone marrow. And in fact, you can see when compared to just pure bone marrow in terms of the cytokine profiles, they're the same, if not double to triple the concentrations of what you would see in your own bone marrow. So stem cells are much richer and the fluid from them is much richer in all these activating cytokines that we always take for granted when we're doing bone grafting or BMP type work, for example. So in bone marrow, when you take the umbilical cord fluid and the lysate and you mix it with bone marrow, what this slide is intended to show is above and below the, the controls versus the right side of the screens with the lysate, you see increasing density of bone marrow cell proliferation. These are bone marrow levels. On average, it's a nine to 11% increase per generation of these cells. Uh, another thing, uh, uh, bone marrow cells, yes, they're growing, but the question is, are they active? And as you know, for any bone injury process, the bone cells have to kind of migrate to the fracture area, right? So this is a, what's called a trans-well study. You basically have a membrane, you have all the cells on one side, 
and then you activate them and you wait for them to cross the membrane and go to the other side. And that's basically what a transworm migration study is. And again, not only is it growing more, the bone marrow cells proliferate more, but they actually become more, my, more bioactive in terms of movement. And they're about nine to 11, about 15% more, they'll traverse a greater distance uh, in that same time with activation of these things. Uh, and then finally, for bone marrow, actual bone production, you can see osteogenesis has increased first primary cartilage and then subsequent uh, laying down the, uh, the uh, uh, quote unquote, the matrix by which bone marrow will actually ultimately form vein. You can see this alizarin red study right there showing again how this whole movement, migration, activation, and production of these bone marrow type proteins is significantly increased by sometimes two to three fold, even within three generations of activated, uh, of, of activated cells. And then finally, osteogenesis itself, you can see uh, the, the stains there, and you can see the capillary network that's associated with the microtubule changes. It basically, when a bone cell starts growing, it spreads this wing or like this matrix of, of, of microtubules around itself, and that becomes the primary matrix by which subsequent cartilage formation and bone formation occurs. And that significantly increased p values of 0.01 or 0.001 in this case uh, after, uh, after three or four generations. And here's a kind of close up to show that with that, um, with that bone matrix increase, there's also an increase of the basic underlying angiogenesis or the capillary network, the blood supply that's absolutely necessary for any tissue healing. And that's significantly increased by a factor of three to five fold, again, by simple conditioning with this lysate fluid, which is, is a fascinating thing. So simply put, that's the basic science. So I'm gonna finish up real quick. I'm gonna fly through this part, which is the boring part of the talk. But what we've been looking at is like, how does this affect bone healing, right? So I, I mentioned all this basic science work. You can tell I'm obviously most excited about that part. But on the clinical side, we've been using it to look at markers of increased bone healing. And this has led to some new things too as well. So long story short, we've been publishing ACDF papers forever since I was a resident looking at bone density. But early on when Jeff Wong and I used to publish papers on, on fusion rates and things like that, we always used to say, like typical ACDF case two level, we'd always used to say, you know, it's really hard to track fusions because you can kind of do it as they go with flexion extension films and then you get a CT 18 months later. But how do you track them as they go, right? You know, how do you really, it looks a little whiter, yay, you know? So, but what we came up with is this, is this way of doing bone densities. And what we do, sorry, I'm, I'm not so good with this little clicker. But what we do is we actually take Photoshop and the photo analysis brightness feature, you can measure the brightness of bone. We measure the brightness of the vertebral bodies above and below. We use that as an index and we then measure the brightness within the inner body space. So what that's saying is that the brightness of the C56 disk space at four or five random sample points within the first graft behind the, uh, the implant is 48% as dense in certain areas as the bone above it. At C67 at this point at three months, the bone at C67, which is obviously darker and more bones coming in is 63% as bright. It's just the brightness index, but it's given us a way to follow the brightness of fusions when there's no metal or something obscuring to see how the bone's becoming more dense or, or the density of the space increases. It just gives us a number, because if not, you always ask yourself, how the hell do you actually follow a fusion from 0.0 to two years or whatever, right? So that was a way we came up with a while back. So we started looking at this. So when you look at neck pain outcomes for people who just have standard ACDF with a little bit of demineralized bone matrix, and either their own, we aspirate their own bone from their crest, we still do that to this day, and then we either do or don't precondition with umbilical cord fluid, their own bone marrow aspiration and local bone. We found that VS neck pain scores, is just, they're very similar, no real difference. Some early improvements in VS neck pain with the, the pretreated group, which may be the anti-inflammatory effect, we don't know, but that's a trend that we saw. It's not that statistically significant, it's only P.01. The NDIs, again, we see some differences at 24 and 36 weeks, again, only a P of 0.01 in terms of pain. But what's interesting is when you look at the fusions and how robustly they come in, therein lies the rub. Just like the BMP studies, that's where we see the big differences. Because when we look at inner body density, this is a P, and this is mislabeled, it should be a P of 0.001, but you can see beginning at 24, 36 weeks, and 52 weeks above, the patients pre-treated with these umbilical cord lysates and mesenchymal stem cells have much, much denser inner body fusions. Bone comes in much more rapidly, much brighter, much thicker, much akin to the BMP type papers that we've all read and loved, right? But this is another mechanism because remember, these things never produce BMP proteins. They, they cause an increased expression, but these things themselves do not express BMP-like proteins. So 
And that's that. So that's a, this is a two-level case. And the reason I show this, this is a very unusual case. I use this purely as a teaching point. This was a case where we literally ran out of this umbilical cord lysate. For whatever reason that day, we opened a little vial and our scrub tech stuck it all on one graft. So this graft contained it right there at the top level at C34, but the bottom two did not. This is a three-month x-ray. And you can see that the density of that bone healing was significantly higher than the rest. And I use that just as an intricate screw up on our point, but it illustrates the point of what we're basically seeing, a much increased rapid bone healing or cartilage formation and then bone healing of patients that we treated with this. Again, I'm not here to say anything. This is intended purely as a talk to get you to think about things because this is the things we're starting to see. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that this stuff is magic or works really well. But this is a whole new mechanism by which we're understanding tissue healing, bone formation, and cartilage healing. So, and then the same is done. We did the same exact study with 144 control cases from our prior publications with 53 cases of bone marrow, local bone treated with this stuff. So basically the same bone graft, one treated with this stuff, one not treated with this stuff, just all autologous stuff. And we don't use BMP, by the way. So this is a typical 63-year-old. You can see the fusion masses. And again, we're doing the same thing. VS back pain and leg pain scores, no significant differences early on. Uh, again, uh, some improvements long-term uh, with it, but uh, not super statistically significant. But again, bone density-wise, this is six weeks, 24 weeks, and 52 weeks, the bone densities. These, and people say, oh, wow, that's pretty intense bone formation on a relatively osteoporotic patient. And again, we didn't do anything except add these umbilical cord lysates uh, to it. And so and again, when we go to the numbers, what do we see? almost at all points where there's statistically 0.001 more significant. I'm not talking about pain scores or anything like that. I'm talking about just simple optical density of bones seen. Because again, we use autologous bone, we use a neutral like tricalcium phosphate carrier, and we either added or did not add this stuff, right? Okay. So this leads me to the most controversial part of our talk, because I've just told you that this stuff seems to help tissue healing, but it also like the lupus and the rheumatoid arthritis has a significant anti-inflammatory effect. Our data suggests there is some type of anti-inflammatory pain effect because all the patients pre-treated with this stuff had slightly better pain scores early on. Again, not statistically significant, but there was a trend. So we partook a very controversial study that I will talk about, but, uh, and again, I want to put it, again, it's about tissue healing, pain management. Rafael Nadal had it done. A bunch of very famous athletes had it done for acute injuries and pain. And really, in this study, what we did is based on all the anti-inflammatory cytokines that we're seeing expressed, we did a rescue transforaminal epidural study. Now, let me describe really quickly what that is because I'm out of time, but this is very interesting, and I'll be off in five minutes, I promise. This is a herniated disc. Uh, this is an active Navy pilot that came to us uh, who's... Uh, has very difficult time continuing to film. He had already, I should say, he'd already had two epidurals and he had pain scores from his military pain doctor showing what his pain score responses were after his two epidurals and he didn't get better. So we enrolled him in the study. We did a third transforaminal epidural with him, this time not with, just with Kellogg, but adding stem cells. So people say, what the hell are you doing here, Larry? I'll be the first to admit, this is weird, but we actually did an intradiscal at the base of the disc herniation injection of some stem cells. We also did a transforaminal standard catalog epidural as well, and then we saw what happened. And what we found was, as he had failed the two prior ones, and again, I know this is a heavily flawed study, don't get me wrong, but as a rescue procedure, which is an interesting way of getting these studies through the IRB, as a rescue procedure, it turned out to be effective. He after having done months and months of physical therapy, two epidurals, he actually responded to this one. He said within three to five weeks, he felt very different than he did in the two epidurals, and those were his pain scores afterwards. So, and that's his MRI at eight months. And again, anecdotal, total garbanzo, but I just want to put this in your head of what people say, what the hell are you doing? We're doing paradiscal, intradiscal injections of umbilical cord stem cell allograft, totally off label but in an in a IRB perspective, rescue third, second or third transforaminal uh, type procedure. Yeah, without a doubt. Exactly, and, and that's why, exactly. So you're, you're bringing up all the right questions because that's what I want everyone to leave here with. I want you to understand that stem cells aren't just like the next BMP. Stem cells do something totally different and we don't understand it. We're getting to and we're getting more answers, but I just want you to leave here to understand that stem cells have very fascinating clinical effects. They really do do some of the things they claim to do. We just don't know why, you know? And so, but that's right, modic changes. So is modic changes a part of natural healing? I don't know. 
Because you know some of our happiest patients are patients that collapse their disc a little bit after a herniation, they have some motor changes, they're stiff and they're happy, right? By the same token, they're also some of the most unhappy patients, right? So I don't know what to say. But this is a very interesting study. Everybody who's ever read epidural literature for herniated disc and sciatica knows that in terms of treatment intensity, do epidurals help acute sciatica and management of a sciatic pain? And the answer is no, right? Everyone knows this. If you look at all the long-term literature, one-year literature for sciatica outcomes, simply put, epidural steroid injections have never been shown to change the disease course. In other words, you're either going to get better or you're not. Right? So if you look at the epidural effect, the top line shows the pain response in the patient's first or second epidurals before they had the second or third rescue epidural with us. And this is the pain response differences, P.001 value. And again, it's the third injection, maybe it's just a cumulative effect, but this is statistically significant. And for the first time in history, we've actually shown that injections can bump a curve, which it's never, just keep in mind, the pain management literature has never been able to show that epidurals can affect the overall one year, six month pain outcomes of a patient. And that's been done a thousand times and they've never been able to show that. So everyone knows that epidurals are palliative and that's basically the best guy. But insurance companies pay for it because it does help, but not long term. And that's what this graph is really intended to show. Look at the divergence at the 24 and 36 weeks post injections and that's the big take home message. And so, and then there, of course, there's the, the this is the, uh, the VAS leg scores. And then finally, this is the ODI differential, huge shifts. And this is where the epidurals versus the epidurals with this lysate umbilical cord fluid, there appears to be difference. And again, there's a lot of flaws. Is it just because we enrolled these patients in a study, they're now getting very good physical therapy, they've been very carefully managed. Is that the cause? I don't know, but what? Yes, the third epidurals. The third was either just catalog alone or, and so, yeah. So that, that's what our next study is gonna be, is just a prospective upfront study, no, not a rescue protocol, but just upfront from the day of sciatica, we're gonna split a study. And there's one that's been done in Europe, it's very fascinating, it looks a lot like this, but that's the next step, you're right. There Blinded, huh? 93 controls, uh, 93 controls that received not, and 45 that did, uh, 40. No, these are all acute. This creation has failed one or two epidurals, so they're all relatively acute. Yes, sir. Yeah, but, right, that's why I'm going to qualify everything I'm saying to you, but I just want you guys to start thinking there may be something to this, and that's, because, like I said, all these athletes swear by it, but, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so, in summary, five take-home points. Stem cells don't work the way you think. It's epigenetic. They don't directly themselves heal shit. Okay, they're gone. They're gone within seven to 10 days of most target tissue injections. They work through secondary signaling of the molecules. One of the best analogies I've heard to this date, stem cells are like FEMA, you know, Federal Emergency Management. Hurricane hits Katrina, total mess down there. FEMA lands, they start directing traffic. They get the firemen over here, they get the construction crews over here, they get the plumbers over here. They start organizing and, and activating and motivating, right? That's what stem cells really basically seem to do. All the science points to it. They themselves do not really grow that much. Uh, the lysates and the cells, cells themselves seem to up here have the same bioactivity in a petri dish. So, so it's about the cytokines, it's about the epigenetic signaling molecules that appears to be most important. The anti-inflammatory effects have intrigued people because they are more powerful than uh, than some of the uh, interferon alpha inhibitors we have, and they may be the best hope we have of in, uh, chronic autoimmune inflammatory modulation. There are now studies at phase two and phase three for all those diseases, macular degeneration, lupus, multiple sclerosis. There are anabolic effects. They do stimulate target tissues to grow. They themselves may not, and that's all the studies kind of summarized quickly. And they're not magical. They seem, and this is the second best thing I've ever heard, they seem to cause a reset. We all have a genetic program that we're born with in terms of growth and tissue healing. That's why when my 16-year-old son who's a swimmer has a small tear in his shoulder from doing too much butterfly, he heals really well within a couple weeks. And it's a, part, it's, a, it's a grade one tear. But you and I, as an adults, not so much. Why? Right? So what stem cells seem to do is between the, their healing effects, their anabolic effects, and their autoimmune modulation effects, they seem to cause a reset back to the primary program. And that's the best way to describe because these cells, all the stuff I just showed you, you know who else behave, all those cells behave just like that? A 16 year old cells. Because if you take 16 year old cells and treat them with or without stem cells, there's no significant difference. And 16 year olds will heal that way on their own, 
which is something we've clinically all known, right? So that is probably an insight, a window into how stem cells actually appear to maybe function. And that's it. Thank you very much.